Hoeker wakker weet is een potsending vir wiskunde-onderwijsers met trots aangebied hier vir eniging vir Afrikaanse wiskunde-onderwijsers, die VAW. Die potsending mik daartoe om al die kolle te verbind tussen literatuur en die praktijk, om so die wiskunde-onderwijsers te inspireer en te bemachtig. Juist so dat ons as wiskunde-onderwijsers kan voortbouw die wereldklas onderwijspraktijk waarmee ons reeds bezig is. Die internet gaan het moeilijk maak om die wereld te reis. In gemak. Ons gaan luister na skrywers, akademici en onderwijsers. Daar gaan selfs een paar onverwachte gesprekke opdek. So sit achter oor en geniet die reis saam met my, man en akkoord. Tot ziens. Goeienavond allemaal, ek gaan oorgaan nou na Engels toe, want ons internationaal sprekers Engels, so vergewe my. I'm going to speak English, I was not born English, it is my um, second language uh, from my far cousin's side, um, it's not something that I'm fluent in, but I'll do my best, so uh, please bear with us. Thank you for joining us, thank you for being patient, and for listening to the song that I think is a very inspirational song. Um, so... I'm just going to admit the people on the side while I speak, so uh, please just bear with me. I just want to firstly say um, thank you for Jeff. So Jeff Green is all the way from America, and I'm going to quickly just give you guys an introduction of who Jeff is. Um, he's, I think his street name is Jeff. His real name is Jeffrey, if I'm right. So um, Jeff, Jeff Green is... And I'm going to make some mistakes here, so please forgive me. Jeff Green is the McMichael Distinguished Professor in the Learning Sciences and Psycho Psychological Studies Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His main area of scholarship involves digital literacy, specifically how people can be effective, efficient, and critically um, users or critical users and creators of information in, techno in technology contexts. He has published over 75 peer-reviewed articles. That, that, so if you can just publish one peer-reviewed article, you're, you're amazing. So he has published over 75 peer-reviewed articles, books and book chapters on self-regulated learning, um, epistemic cognition, and online learning, among other topics. He was the recipient of the 2016 American Psychological Association's Division 15 Richard E. Snow Award for Early contri Contributors. Um, currently, he is co-editor of Educational Psychologist with Dr. Lisa. He was co-editor of the Handbook of Epistemic Cognition and, second, and the second edition of the Handbook of Self-Regulation of Learning and Performance, um, both published by um, Rotledge. Um, Dr. Green holds a PhD in Educational Psychology, as well as a master's degree in Measurement, Statistics and Evaluation, both from the University of Maryland. So I hope I didn't slaughter that. Um, I did my best. So thank you for, um, yeah, for joining us. Thank you for taking out the time. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, there's a big time difference between us, but you are doing this out of your good free will. Um, I just reached out via Twitter to you and you just said yes. Um, and that is awesome. Thank you for doing that for our teachers. And I think they will appreciate it. I do believe that the majority of our teachers did do the pre-reading that I gave them um, and, it, and it, it will help. So basically tonight we are going to talk about learning styles, um, whether it's a myth, whether it's a fact, um, and hopefully at the end of the day, whatever you believed, it will either be enforced or it would um, have changed. So before I carry on, everyone who can, I'm going to ask you to take out your phones and we are going to do a polling exercise. And then after this, I'm going to hand over to Jeff and then he will tell you how he's going to orchestrate this, um, this evening. If he, if he says he's going to give you space to talk or use the chats, just listen and interact, engage with us and just enjoy this um, evening with us. If there's anything that you want to ask us, just drop it in the chats and we will help you. So I'm going to start with a, a poll and so take out your phones I'm going to share my screen now and if you can just verify in the chats that you can see my screen that would be nice uh, 
Um, yes, thank you. Recording available, I might need to leave. Yes, we are going to record and we will make it available to everyone who registered for this evening. So just go to www.menti.com. So it just, just want to drag that away. Um, so it's this URL at the top, www.menti.com. And then it's going to ask you for a code. And then you just type in 22360288 and answer the question. So just, I'm just going to give a minute or two so that we can have some of the people um, polling. Um, that would just give us an indica indication of where you are currently at in terms of what you think. And then Jeff can use that in his, um, in his talk. So if you raise your hands, I, I won't be able to un unmute you now. So I'm going to lower it. Just ask your questions in the chat. And oh, the polling already happened. I do believe that teachers should teach according to learning styles. We currently have a winner. Um, it's the guy from Friends. I uh, don't remember his name, but he's polling at, oh, he's, he's winning. And old grandpa, he has only one person who likes him, which is sad. Um, and then there's a guy who says, I don't know, I'm going to give you 15 to 30 seconds more just to poll, just so we can have an idea of where we are currently at. Um, that is good. 33 people already polled out of a possible 123. I know there's load shedding tonight, so a majority of the people, at least half of them, won't be able to join tonight. So we are doing a recording um, specifically for that. I explained to Jeff what load shedding is, and he did not know the term. So I taught him a new word today. Um, I'm very proud of myself. Okay, so we are done with this poll. Jeff, you have an idea. You can see with the poll where people are currently at. So you can use that. And now I'm going to go to the second question. Um, and the second question is, I do believe that learners learn better when they are taught according to their learning style or styles. Oh, that was quick. Oh, that's very quick. So believe is like a firm conviction. Um, it's something more than just knowing. It's, it's, it's also very personal. So, okay, Jeff, you have the idea? Okay, good. So I'm going to stop sharing now because I think we have a very good idea. At the end of the session, we are going to poll you again. And then maybe this is going to change and old grandpa is going to have some friends or maybe not. So Jeff, I'm going to spotlight you now. Thanks again for doing this. We really do appreciate it. And the floor is yours now. You can dictate however you want to run this talk. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and I'm excited to uh, talk to you about all that you're doing to teach students. Uh, I think I believe teachers are some of the most important people in our society, and I'm so pleased to be talking to you. And I'm really pleased to see that you are thinking carefully about how to teach and what to teach and the best ways to teach. All of that is incredibly important. And teachers are reflective and thoughtful. And I know all the teachers in my life and myself as a teacher, I'm always looking for new ways to teach more effectively, to help students learn more effectively, to help students be successful. And so the opportunity to talk to you about those things is, is a great pleasure. And so thank you again for the, um, for the time that you're spending with me today. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And can, if you can, just in the chat, if you can let me know that you can see it, that would be very helpful. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I'm talking to you today about learning styles, but I also wanna to talk to you about the science of learning, which is a broader topic that relates to learning styles and helps us better understand what learning styles are and how we can think about them. So the science of learning can indeed help us teach and learn. So in the last 50 years, we have done a lot of hard work to better understand how people think how people interact in classrooms, how teachers can be most effective, the ways in which students engage with learning, their motivation, their emotions, um, how all those things affect the way that, that they learn and how we can help students put themselves in the best possible position to learn well. And the science of learning is a broad area of scholarship uh, that I think is really helpful. And I'm always excited to talk to teachers about what the science of learning has taught us so that we can all be better teachers and better learners. 
And for a, a long time, the science of learning was done in, in laboratories. So they were very artificial. We did studies where we put electrodes on people's head or uh, we asked children questions that maybe they didn't fully understand or that they didn't, um, that weren't very similar to what was happening in classrooms. But I'm pleased to say that in the last 20 to 30 years, we've learned a lot in and about classrooms. And the science of learning research that we do today is very authentic. We do it in classrooms with students, with teachers. Yes, there's a role for laboratory research. There are some things that you can do in a laboratory that you can't do in a classroom, but we always take what we find in the laboratory and then test it again in the classroom to make sure that we have tested it in an authentic environment and we know it's going to help students think and learn and be successful. So the science of learning really is about what happens in classrooms, what happens online when students are learning, what happens when teachers are working with students to be successful. And so I'm really excited to share that with you tonight. I will say I've asked Johanna to let me know if there are questions or other concerns that people have expressed in the chat that might require me to stop for a minute. So I'm not going to talk to you the whole time, but while I'm presenting this information, if you have something, if something I say is confusing or you have a, a question that you really need to answer right away, just put in the chat and you will stop me and I'm happy to do that. And then at the end, uh, I want to have a lot of time to talk to you um, and hear your questions and engage in a nice conversation because I always learn a lot from teachers and I'm hoping that you're going to learn something tonight too. Sorry about that. So the first thing I want to know is what have you have you heard? And you can put this in the chat. Um, I like to hear what you've heard learning styles are. So, um, you know, just a, a brief sentence or a couple words in the chat. What are some things that you've heard about learning styles? What are they? Because um, there's a lot of different ideas about learning styles out there. And so it helps me to understand what you have heard. Um, and the poll was great. The poll told us something about um, your beliefs about learning styles, but there's a fundamental question here, and that is what are they? And so if you can share in the chat um, what you think learning styles are, um, that would be really helpful. So let me give you a minute to do that. Okay. So uh, the idea that there are three main learning styles, the audio, the visual, and, and the movement style, that's uh, very common, um, that they are the preferred manner in which you receive and make sense of, sense of information. Again, absolutely, that's something that's very much out there. The VARC model, um, yes, absolutely. Um, learners choose a style that works for them. That's something that we hear a lot about learning styles. Absolutely, that's a very common uh, understanding of what learning styles are. Um, ways that people take up information the best? Absolutely. These are all very common things. These are things that uh, teachers in America hear a lot, that students in, in the United States hear a lot, students in Europe and other places hear these things as well, for sure. Um, the next question is, what kinds of learning styles are there? And you've already listed some of those in the chat. There's the visual, there's auditory, there's something called kinesthetic or movement. Um, are If you have other learning styles that you've heard of, um, certainly please put them in the chat because I, I would like to hear about them. The last question I have, again, reflects the poll that Johan put up there, which is how can learning styles help us teach and help students learn? Um, and some of you have already stated that when you connect your instruction to match the student's learning style, the idea is that the student will learn more effectively. Um, is writing and feeling a learning style? So there are some ideas or um, theories of learning styles that would say that some students are better writing out their ideas than others. Um, there are certain kinds of theories of learning styles that talk about um, some students learn best in connection with others, working with others, uh, the interpersonal learning styles, absolutely. Um, naturalistic is a kind of learning style. It's actually also something called a multiple intelligence. So there's a theory of multiple intelligences and naturalistic is one of them. Um, so physical learning styles, etc. This is great. So you're listing a lot of things that I've heard before that's very common in our society and sounds like they're pretty common in your society as well. Um, and, and these are messages that parents and students and teachers and principals and other people have gotten uh, time and time again. They're very, very common. So 
actually, there are over 40 different theories of learning styles. So this is one, and um, some of the people in the chat have mentioned these ideas, but some people say there are, for example, visual learning styles, verbal, social, uh, combination learning styles, so a mix of all of them. Musical learning style is one that gets mentioned sometimes, and certainly the physical or kinesthetic learning style is one that gets mentioned quite a bit. There's other learning style theories that talk about subcategories of these. So some people are a reasoning learning style person. Some people are more of a hands learning style person. And then of course, the one that was mentioned most often is this visual auditory kinesthetic learning style idea. Yes, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory. It's interesting, Howard Gardner actually has said that his theory is not a learning styles theory, it's a different kind of theory. Um, but many people use his multiple intelligences uh, theory as a kind of learning style theory. So it's actually, um, there's a, I had an opportunity to hear a talk by one of his colleagues. And when I mentioned that some teachers were using multiple intelligences as a learning style theory, his colleague got very upset with me. Uh, he actually really argued against that. So um, Howard Gardner may disagree with multiple intelligences as a learning style theory, but absolutely you see that all the time. And I have a lot of teachers who tell me that they use multiple intelligences theory as a learning styles theory. So very common. So there are really over 40 different learning styles theories out there. Um, and they all uh, are based in the style this idea that we call the matching hypothesis. And it's something that was mentioned in the chat. It's uh, this idea that if a student is a visual learner, then they will learn all information. And that's a key point, all information best if they see it. And what happens is you find these tips and tricks that you see here where, um, and this is developed for teachers and also in work settings, where people will write out, okay, if you're a visual learner, then you, you learn best by watching things or visualizing things or drawing those types of tips. And we have teachers that spend a lot of time taking what they want to teach and thinking about, okay, how can I present all the information visually? Because again, the matching hypothesis says a visual learner will learn everything better if that information is presented visually. If, can There's I interrupt there? You can, um, absolutely. I, I received direct messages that ask, uh -huh. um, are you following some form of um, learning style? Um, did you prep this in some form of learning style? And um, was were you conscious about your learning styles when you did this? Um, I don't know if you want to answer that now, but yeah, that is, that, that's a question. It's a great question. So uh, I actually design my, talks based upon something called multimedia learning theory that I'm actually going to talk about towards the end of the presentation. So multimedia learning theory has a, a couple different pieces and I'll talk about them, but that guides how I present information. Okay. Awesome. Great. Great. Good question. So uh, the matching hypothesis would say that tactile learners, or um, some people call these kinesthetic learners, but they learn best with examples through discussion, by being active, by taking breaks. And again, what the matching hypothesis says, which, and the matching hypothesis is the foundation of a learning styles theory. It says that a tactile learner will learn everything better if the material is presented in a tactile way. And I'm sure as teachers, if you've tried to adjust your uh, curriculum or your lessons to match a student's learning style, it can be a lot of work, right? Because you've got to think, okay, how can I present everything for my visual learners? Now, how can I present it differently for all my tactile or kinesthetic learners? How can I present it a different way for all my auditory learners? And that's just kind of the simplest learning style model. There are some learning styles, theories, or models where there's 10, 15, 20 different kinds of learners, and it, it takes a lot of time. And I think a question that we need to ask ourselves is, is that a good use of teacher's time? So I don't know what your experience is like. I know that teachers in the United States, they have a lot to do, uh, much more to do than we would like and their time is precious, and we want them to be focusing on the things that are most helpful and not wasting their time. And so we have to ask the question, is it the best use of teacher's time 
to kind of construct their curricula and their lessons around these kinds of learning styles because it, it takes a long time. So the thing I wanna emphasize is that educators who use learning styles to differentiate their instruction, to tailor their instruction, to personalize their instruction to students, they're trying to help students learn. And that is fantastic. And that is at the heart of why I'm so excited to talk to teachers because teachers really care. They want their students to be successful. And every teacher that's using learning styles, I think is doing so because they really think this is gonna help students learn. And that is fantastic. And we wanna support that. I wanna support that. But there is a however, and I'm sure you knew this was coming. Um, there's simply no evidence that learning styles exist. And, and that's a pretty definitive statement. And so I can understand if you, you know, might might find that a little upsetting or a little concerning, or you might wonder if it's really uh, a fair statement. Um, what I can tell you is that there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies done by people that really wanted to find evidence of learning styles. I, I want to find evidence of learning styles. It would be great if we had some kind of assessment that could determine a student's learning style, and then we could teach that style and they would learn everything better that way. That would be great. It would be so effective. Unfortunately, we just haven't found any evidence at all. There are just no studies that show and no rigorous studies, no um, carefully uh, conducted and vetted studies that show any evidence that learning styles occurs. Um, and anecdotal evidence is a great question. We're going to talk about that in a minute because I think anecdotal evidence is a um, important Thing to think about when we think about learning styles. Um, the joke that I make is that, oops, sorry, um, learning styles are kind of like zombies. They're popular since the 1970s, they're scientifically inaccurate, and they just won't die. Um, and again, I, I don't mean to kid. I, every teacher that is using learning styles to teach students is doing so from a wonderful place because they really want students to be successful, and that is fantastic, and I want you to be out there trying new things, trying to help students be successful. But there's just no evidence that the effort necessary um, to teach the students learning styles will lead to good results. But there are plenty of other things that we can do to help students be successful, to differentiate our instruction, to help them, and we're gonna talk about that. And there's a role for some ideas behind learning styles. But let's stop for a second and say, wait, why? Why is this the case? Well, students learn and perform differently. We see that. We see students, some students understand an idea really quickly. Other students need more time to understand it. Some students complete assessments and tasks more quickly than others. Some students perform uh, at a higher level than others at different times. That's natural. Of course, students are different. But what, it, what we found is that every student learns best when they are presented multiple different representations of content. So that key idea about learning styles, that if you're a visual learner, you learn all information best visually, and you don't learn well in terms of auditory or kinesthetic or any other combination, that's simply not the case. In fact, we are all visual learners, we're all auditory learners, we're all kinesthetic learners. And the more different ways we encounter the same content, the more likely it is that we'll understand it, the more likely it is that we'll remember it, and the more likely it is that we'll be able to use it later in life. So is anyone a auditory learner? No. Everyone's an auditory learner and a visual learner and a kinesthetic learner. So people learn best when they see, hear, and interact with content. So if you think about in chemistry, you might explain to a student verbally, uh, you know, the atom and electrons and protons and neutrons. You might draw a picture to help them see it. You might have the student use a model like in the picture here to try to get a sense of it. And each of those things is valuable. And there is great value in thinking about all the different ways that you can represent information. So can you represent it visually? Can you represent it auditorially? Can you make it physical so students can interact with it? Can you have students work together and teach each other? All of those things are great. We just don't want students thinking there's only one way that they can learn. Uh, the same thing um, is, or another 
idea about this is that some ideas are best taught in a particular way, right? So think about maps and geography. I, I think it's really hard to verbally or auditorily explain a map to say, well, this country's here and that country is there and then this one's above it. I mean, that, that's just really arduous and difficult. I don't think that's gonna be nearly as effective as just showing a student a, a visual map, right? Showing them a map. But learning styles theory would say that auditory learners would learn about geography and maps and the world better by hearing it. That just doesn't make any sense. And I've never seen a student that learned better that way. So another example, how would a student with a visual learning style learn a second language? Would we have to write out all the phonetic pronunciations? And again, <clears throat> there might be a role for that, but probably the best way for that student to learn a second language is to hear it and to speak it and to engage in it. It's not the case that they're gonna learn that content best visually, but again, <clears throat> that's what learning style says. It says that all students learn, uh, a, a visual student, a visual learning style student learns all content better visually. And I see a great question in the chat, and that is how do we accommodate learners with impairments? So it is absolutely the case that some students have impairments or difficulties with a particular sensory modality. Uh, we might have students that have visual difficulties or auditory difficulties, et cetera. Um, and that's fine. And we should accommodate for those students, absolutely. But it's not the case that a student that might have a visual difficulty can only learn auditorily, right? They can probably also um, touch, they can talk and interact. There's probably other things that they can do as well. We don't wanna suggest that a student can only learn through one sense or one way of interacting with the world, because um, that's almost always not the case unless the impairments are um, numerous. So um, the next question we might ask is, does it matter if learning styles aren't real? I mean, who cares? If I said we're all visual learners and we're all auditory learners and we're all kinesthetic learners, does this really matter? Maybe we should just keep thinking about learning styles. Well. I think there are some ways in which it does matter and which it can be actually kind of dangerous to tell students that they have a learning style. So uh, this is a cartoon and the student is saying, as we start a new school year, Mr. Smith, I just want you to know that I'm an abstract sequential learner and trust that you'll conduct yourself accordingly. Now, this is kind of a joke and it's a cartoon, but something very similar to this happened to me in my class. So a number of years ago here at the University of North Carolina, it was the first day of class and a student walked in and it was kind of a lecture class. We would have discussion, et cetera. Um, the student walked in and came up to me and the student was very nice. And the student said, Professor Green, I just want you to know that I'm a kinesthetic learner. And so I really can't learn in your class. I can't learn listening to you talk. I can't learn watching you put things up on the screen or on the board. Um, I can only learn kinesthetically, but um, I don't want to cause any trouble. So I'm just going to sit in the back and I'm going to be quiet. I won't bother anyone, but I'm not going to really pay attention because I'm a kinesthetic learner and I just can't learn this way. And again, a very nice student, but that student was missing out on opportunities. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to be able to talk to that student about, you know, actually, I think you might have gotten some incorrect information and um, you, you can learn visually and auditorily as well as kinesthetically. But when we tell students that they have one learning style, some of them tune out information in other learning styles, right? So some students will just say, well, I am just a kinesthetic learner, so I can't learn visually, so I'm not going to pay attention in school, or I'm not going to pay attention in this lecture, or I'm not going to pay attention to this movie or film, whatever the case may be. So I do think there's actually a little bit of danger when we tell students they have a learning style, because sometimes they, um, they narrow what it is they think they can learn, and that's, they're missing out on opportunities, and that's, that's really unfortunate. Uh, Jeff, I have so, a question. Please. I received a question please. on that. Um, so do you think uh, that if you promote learning styles or if you believe in learning styles that it promotes a fixed mindset? That's a great question. So you're referring to um, the growth mindset theory by Carol Dweck. Um, and they actually are kind of two different things. So it might be the case that a student might decide that they have 
a fixed learn uh, fixed mindset means that the student thinks they have a certain amount of intelligence or capacity for learning something and once they reach that capacity they can learn no more so the common expression of that is people who say things like well i'm just not a math person i just don't understand math that's a kind of a fixed mindset about math people might say something similar about history or science or whatever the case may be learning styles don't talk so much about capacity to learn as much as they talk about the mechanism by which people learn. So I, I suppose it's possible that a student who is told they're an auditory learner might then also develop a fixed mindset. It might be more likely, but I think they're, I think they're a little separate. Um, and I don't necessarily think they have to go um, hand in hand. Although we certainly don't want students developing a fixed mindset. And if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that at the end. Does, does that help? Yes, thanks. That's good. Questions are good. They give me a chance to get a drink of water. So thank you. So why do learning styles feel real? Well, I think many of us have had what I call an aha moment, right? And um, how it usually happens is like this. So you're working with a student, and this is a, a student that's very capable, and they want to do well and they're working hard and they're just not understanding it. Maybe they're reading a textbook and they're just not understanding it. And you come over and you try to help them and you're talking to them and they're just, they're really struggling and they're getting frustrated. And then you say, well, let me draw you a picture. And then you draw a picture and they immediately get it. That's that aha moment. It's easy, I think, for all of us to then infer that, well, this must be a visual, this must be a student with a visual learning style. This must be a student who just learns things better visually. And students have that experience and teachers have that experience. My guess is what happened is that the student was starting to understand from the textbook or your verbal instruction, and it was building and building and building. And the picture kind of brought them to the point where they fully understood. It was just kind of a coincidence. You could have gone in the other order. You could have started with the picture. They probably would have struggled a little bit. You could have come over and explained it to them. Maybe then they would have gotten it. But students and teachers often have these moments and they feel really wonderful. When a student is struggling and then you think of a different way to present the information and they get it, it's a, that's one of the things that makes teaching wonderful and it makes it a joy. Um, but we shouldn't assume that that means that the student can only learn one way. Because again, I think that's really dangerous and many students report kind of um, being told they're a certain kind of learner and then not utilizing those other styles when they could and they should and they would benefit from it. So I do think learning styles have a lot of intuitive appeal um, that I think helps um, create this myth that they're a real thing. So there's a question here in the chat, doesn't a learner have a dominant learning style but still include the other styles in your lessons? So <clears throat> students have preferences and, and that's okay. Plenty of students have preferences. Some students like to engage with material physically that's fine. Some students like to listen to lectures. Some students like to uh, watch things happen. That's fine. Preferences are fine. But what we don't want to assume is that students can't learn other ways. And I don't think we want to communicate to students that there's only one way that they can learn. They might have a preference. That's fine. Um, but we don't want them to think that it, that preference is a limit, that they can only learn one way. That's a good question. Now, underneath learning styles is something really important. And I, I mentioned it at the beginning of our talk. What we really wanna do is what we call differentiate or differentiation. We wanna meet individual students' needs. We want every student to be successful. And we know that students are different. Different students have different experiences. Some students are effective at learning one thing and struggle at another thing. And then there's another student who's the opposite. And so as teachers, we want to differentiate our instruction and provide every student with what they need to be successful. That can be really hard, particularly when you have a lot of students in your class. So I'm not suggesting that that's an easy thing to do or that it's always possible. The more students you have in your class, the harder it gets to differentiate. But we want to find ways to meet individual students' needs as much as we can, whenever we can. That's great. But there are better ways to differentiate than learning styles. So when you're thinking about how to help individual students be successful, 
rather than uh, constructing your lessons so that there are visual components and auditory components and you're kind of tailoring to those things, I mean, that's an okay thing to do. But when you're differentiating for individual students, I would encourage you to think instead about these four things, their prior knowledge, their interest or motivation, something called their funds of knowledge, and, this, and how to scaffold to the amount and kind of knowledge that they have. So I'm gonna talk about those real quick. Um, and then if you have other questions, I'm happy to um, talk more about that. But prior knowledge is one of the main drivers of learning. We learn new things based upon what we already know. And so different students know different things, they have different experiences. And if we can connect the new thing we're trying to teach to what they already know, that's a great way to differentiate. So one student may know um, these three things, and if you could connect new, new knowledge to those three things, that will work for that student. Another student may know two other different things. And so trying to understand what your students already know and then tailor the instruction to that, great way to do it. Funds of knowledge is a broader concept. So students have values and culture and um, experiences at home that <clears throat> they really understand well because they've lived it. If you can connect what you're trying to teach to their lived experience, that's a great way to help them learn. And so if you understand something about students' um, culture and environment they come from, that can be a great way to differentiate. Interest or motivation is another way. Um, I, I often say it's nearly impossible to, to be deeply interested about everything, right? We have, All of us have different things we're interested in, and that's fine. We don't have to be deeply interested in everything to learn it. But if we know that a student is interested in something, if we can connect what we're trying to teach to that interest, that can really help. Now, it won't be the case that we can do that for every student, for every lesson, but we try to as much as possible. And motivation is a complicated topic that we can talk more about if you'd like to. But very often, people think that students have to be intrinsically motivated. They have to love learning to learn something. And that's great when that happens. And I adore when students love what they're learning and they're really engaged, that's fantastic. Not every student is going to be deeply motivated for every topic, that's just not realistic. And so instead, there are different kinds of motivation. And again, we can talk more about that if you want to. There are different kinds of motivations that we can try to recognize in students. And if we can recognize the kind of motivation they have for the thing that we're teaching, we can differentiate based upon motivation. And then finally, we can scaffold or tailor our instruction to how much knowledge the student has and the kind of knowledge they have. So some students know a little, some students know a lot, some students have really accurate knowledge, some students have kind of inaccurate knowledge, and if we can figure that out for students, we can differentiate and tailor our instruction to the amount and kinds of knowledge that they have. All of those things, and there's other things too, uh, all of those things are better ways to differentiate, better ways for teachers to spend their time than trying to differentiate or personalize or individualize, all those words are kind of the same, to um, learning styles. Now, <clears throat> this is an academic piece uh, written by a colleague of mine, and I'm not gonna go into this big complicated model, but I just wanna kind of point out that there's actually a rich literature on personalization and how to personalize instruction to learners' characteristics. And there's a citation there at the bottom if you wanna look it up. But I wanna point out those um, boxes in the dashed lines there, it shows that there's just a lot of different things that we could personalize to and that we can use to personalize with. And um, there's a great literature out there. You'll notice learning styles aren't in there because um, learning styles really aren't an effective way to differentiate. So there's a question here in the chat, would students learn to prefer a certain learning style from their foundation phase, or is it something intrinsic <clears throat> that's not impacted from external forces? So preferences tend to change over time. That's another reason why we don't wanna tell students that they have a single learning style, because as students develop and grow over time, their preferences change and the ways their experiences with content change. And someone who really enjoys lectures at a younger age might grow to really enjoy active learning techniques at a later age or vice versa. So no, these things are not intrinsic and students' preferences do indeed change over time. That's a great question. So in sum, learning styles aren't real. There's just no evidence for them. I, again, I, I wish there was, because it would be um, so helpful to have something so straightforward 
as a way to help us teach students, but there's just no evidence and people have done a lot of work to look for learning styles and they just can't find the evidence for it. But the idea behind learning styles, differentiation is really good. And there's different ways to differentiate or personalize or individualize instruction that I encourage you to explore. They're just a much better use of your time. They will help your students learn more effectively. Now, I've been talking about learning styles, but I wanna bring us back to the science of learning because the science of learning is how we discovered that learning styles weren't a great way to spend our time. The science of learning has revealed other myths about learning that are very common, um, but actually aren't accurate. And when teachers try to adjust for those myths, it actually doesn't help students learn. So I thought I'd just mention a couple of them. And again, if you wanna talk about them, we can. Um, Jeff, just before you, you go sure. um, into that, so the question is, do you think that um, teachers or even parents um, mix uh, or, or get confused between uh, learners enjoying a lesson because it was tailored according to their preference versus they actually learned something? Does That's that a great make sense? Okay. Yes, I think that does happen. Um, I, and I think sometimes students might enjoy a particular way of learning, like a kinesthetic learning, um, working with their hands, but they might not learn as much as if they would have maybe heard the teacher talk about something for a while. So I think, I think that absolutely happens and that's a wonderful point to make. My, my assumption about most lessons is that there's a place for different kinds of representations of information. So it can be really helpful to lecture a little bit and then it can be really helpful to have students talk to each other. And then it can be really helpful to have students maybe manipulate the information if they can. Um, and that there's probably a thoughtful way to progress through each of those representations. Um, and, and that's a great way to help students kind of stay engaged because the representations are changing, et cetera. And students might enjoy one part more than another, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to learn more. And in fact, there's good research out there that students often aren't good at judging what's helping them learn. So they sometimes like things that are less effective than the things they like less. And one of the things that I say to students is that I am thrilled if you're enjoying learning and you're finding it really engaging and interesting, that's great. It's not always gonna be the case. Most people have things they need to learn that can be kind of a struggle. And that doesn't mean that they're not important or they're not being successful or that there's a problem. It's just sometimes some things are less enjoyable than others, um, but that doesn't mean that you're not learning. And some ways of learning require more effort than others. That doesn't mean that they're less effective. Um, there's a question here in the chat. Where does personalized learning rate in the John Hattie effect size list? That's a great question. So John Hattie has, is this researcher in Australia who's done so many uh, meta-analyses and brought together all these meta-analyses to determine you know, what ways of teaching are most effective. And I'm actually not aware of a specific effect size for personalization. There might be one in there. And if there is, I apologize, I don't know it. But the reason why is because personalization, as I showed you in that, um, that figure from a couple slides ago, there's so many different ways to personalize. So the question is, well, personalization to motivation. What's the effect size or the efficacy of that? Personalizing to interest. What's that one? Personalizing to prior knowledge. What about that one? And I think we just need more research to determine all of those. Um, <clears throat> but I do know that um, a student's prior knowledge is a very strong predictor of their success in school. And so personalization of prior knowledge, I think, is a really powerful direction to go. Um, examples of different kinds of motivation. Sure. So uh, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I'll give you just a couple examples. So there's intrinsic motivation that is, again, like I love the intrinsically motivated, someone being intrinsically motivated, what that means is they love the content, they find it really interesting, they would learn about it outside of school, they would just do it for fun. That's a wonderful kind of motivation. Not all people will be intrinsically motivated about all things. There are kinds of extrinsic outside motivation that can be really helpful. So some students learn because they understand it's important for a goal that they have. That's an extrinsic motivator, right? They wanna reach that goal. Um, that's fine. That can be a really adaptive motivation because they feel in control and they know that's a goal I wanna reach. I don't love what I have to learn at this moment to make another step towards that goal, but I know it's important. And so I'm going to learn and I'll be fine. 
Some students <clears throat> have an extrinsic motivation where they're afraid they're going to be punished if they don't learn it. That's a different kind of motivation. That's not as useful or adaptive or positive a motivation. That one doesn't work as well. There's something called a motivation. A motivation is where students are not motivated at all um, and they're actually kind of defeated. They feel defeated. And again, that would be a very bad kind of motivation. So those are some examples. There's other kinds of motivations as well. Great question. So let me just um, list a couple more myths and then it's almost time for questions and all these questions so far have been fabulous. I'm sure you have a lot more. Um, <clears throat> one myth is that the brain has a left side and a right side and the left side is logical and the right side is creative or artistic. That's not true. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you do something logical or you do something creative, you're using your whole brain. Um, you don't use a side of it. That doesn't make any, you know, there's no neuroscience evidence for that. Um, your whole brain is used um, for all the things that we talked about. Another myth is that today's students are digital natives who kind of intuitively know how to use technology to learn. That's not true. Um, when you talk to students, what they'll say is they know how to use technology to uh, get on the web and surf. Um, they know how to, um, you know, maybe chat and that kind of thing, but actually using technology to learn is a very specific set of skills that most students don't have. They have to be taught. Um, my statement is breaking brains. Sorry. Um, I hope it isn't too painful. Um, we can uh, certainly talk more about that um, if you would like. Um, multitasking. Many parents um, will say that their students have to multitask today, that their student has to do their homework with the TV on, with their phone next to them, texting their friends. It's not true. Um, the human brain can do one thing at a time really well. And anytime you switch from working on an assignment to checking your phone, to back to the assignment, you're actually decreasing your performance. You're taking longer to get the work done. Um, today's students cannot kind of inherently multitask. No one can. And then I mentioned this earlier, but many teachers think that extrinsic motivation is a bad thing. And in fact, there's different kinds of extrinsic motivation. And some of them are really useful and are very normal. Other ones are not. And so uh, we need to take a more nuanced approach to extrinsic motivation. Um, finally, there are better ways to design instruction. So I mentioned this earlier when I was asked kind of what ideas did I use to develop this presentation. One that I think about is called the Cotton Theory of Multimedia Learning. And basically, this is kind of complicated, but I'll just sum it up to you and say that um, <clears throat> there's a theory of learning that says that our minds have kind of two input channels. One is an auditory channel and one's a visual channel. Now, these aren't learning styles because um, everyone has both. Um, but what you want to try to do is when you represent information, you want to balance the two, right? So you don't want to have all words. You don't want to have all visuals. You want to have a mix of both, which is what I try to do. If you'll notice, most of my slides don't have a lot of text. Um, I want you to see more pictures or just, you know, short sentences, and then you're able to listen to me talk and maybe watch me gesture, and that will help you learn. That's what the Cotton Theory of Multimedia Learning says. Briefly, um, there's a lot more to it. Finally, um, there's some great resources out there that talk about these um, ideas. Dan Willingham has a great book called Why Don't Students Like School? It's a fantastic book. Um, Pooja Agarwal has a, a book about powerful teaching and the science of learning. That's great. I have a book on self-regulation that you can check out. Um, so there's a lot more to learn when it comes to the science of learning. Um, and I hope that what we've talked about today kind of gives you a taste of it and maybe get your interest, gets you interested in it. Um, and these resources might help you explore more. But um, that's all I'll say for now. I'm interested in your questions and your thoughts and our poll, um, but I hope this was helpful. Thank you for the time. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, there is some questions. I, I've um, collected them in a Word document. So, um, but before I, I, I'm going to do, um, yeah, talk about it. I, I first just want to share why um, I actually find this very interesting. So, and I, I talked to you about this just before the session. In my master's dissertation, I, I interviewed a lot of teachers and I asked them specifically, why do they integrate ICT into the lessons, uh, multimedia, etc.? And one of the teachers specifically made mention to learning styles and the other teachers also, but not as with such... Um, strong belief as the, the specific teacher and I obviously I that was part of my it was in my dissertation and I referenced a lot I, I made a lot of citations that that tried to back this 
statements from the teachers. And then my study, um, my supervisor told me, no, please go and reread the literature that like that is, uh, it was true in the seventies, it's not true anymore. And it, it was literally like someone pulled the rug out of my feet. Like I could not believe, like I wanted to, to rebel against my study leader because I truly believed there's something like learning styles. And then when I had to think about my belief in learning styles, I asked myself, why do I believe it? And I had no reason. I wasn't taught about learning styles at university. Um, I did not do any courses on learning. I just believed it from, it came from, from uh, external sources. So um, then I read the book uh, two weeks ago uh, um, from Adam Grant, and it says uh, the book's name is Think Again. And that is what I'm actually trying to promote for these teachers um, is to rethink your thinking. Um, because I, I, I stepped into that trap where I believed that what I believe is true purely because I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now I'm presented with data and information that contradicts this belief that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it, it's not a pleasant feeling. So I think, I think that there will be some feel feelings of conflict towards what you presented. And of obviously you've experienced this, so you won't take it personally, but I think people will feel like, no, this, what this guy is talking about does not make sense. Um, be because what you experienced somewhere um, tells mm -hmm. a different story. And then um, something clicked when you said about the different representations. And then I thought about, I think the guy, guy's name is Richard Skemp. He gave this continu continu continuum of understanding where you move from instrumental understanding to relational understanding. And then, where, so basically you get all of these bits and pieces of information and then as they connect, suddenly you understand it on a conceptual <laughs> method. And that happens to us as teachers. You, you explain, you explain, you explain, and then you show, and then the, the dots are connected. And then we think it's because we've shown, but if we didn't explain, and we just purely presented the visual thing, it would not even make sense. Yep, so exactly. it's thanks to all of those parts of information. That's what I'm, I'm taking out from this um, session. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, thank you for that. So um, you can, uh, the rest of the, the people, please in the, in the chats, ask your questions. I'm going to put up a poll first and, and then I'm going to ask three or four of the questions that we've received. Um, mm -hmm. So just bear with me. There's the screen. So please just go to menti.com again. And there's a new code now. It is 4223-3198. And then we just need at least one or two people at the grandfather. And then I think we've just opened someone's mind. It doesn't mean that they have to believe it now. It's just open now for, for critical thinking. So that's... So if you teach according to learning styles, it's okay, it, it changed. No, no, maybe the people who still want to say yes, maybe they are afraid now to say <laughs> yes. It's anonymous. So if you still want to say yes, say yes. Um, but it's something that we need to talk about as teachers because this, it consumes so much of our time when we try to make a lesson or tailor a lesson according to learning styles. And if it doesn't improve the output, why do we, um, put so much effort into the input. So, so that's that's one argument. Okay. So the next question, um, let's see if it, if we move on. There we go. So the next question, please just quickly answer that one. It's like a pretest, post test. I like it. Yeah. So maybe we can write a paper on this. <laughs> okay. So, so there's some minds that's been changed, which is good. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to ask some of the questions that popped up. Um, in terms of direct instruction, so there's a lot of con con controversy about it, direct instruction, which I think will fall, if you believe in learning styles, it, it will fall more in the audit, auditive and more visual maybe. But what is the sci scientific evidence for the effectiveness of direct instruction? Um, and then if you can say, especially for learners with barriers. 
Sure. So direct instruction and the um, there's a big controversy about direct instruction. It, it, it may be one of the most controversial ideas in pedagogy and educational theory. So I believe personally that there's very good evidence that there's a critical role for direct instruction in teaching. And Paul Kirshner and other people have demonstrated that uh, students often learn best when you directly instruct something to them. My concern is that it can't, I don't think it's effective to be the only way in which you teach. Um, so I don't think, there are some people that say we should never directly instruct. We should always allow students to just kind of discover what they are learning, to just give them a, a great question and have them go off and try to understand it. I don't, I think that's too extreme. So direct instruction may be on one side, at the other extreme may be pure discovery learning. I think there's a role for, for direct instruction. I also think there's a role for what we might call guided instruction, where you've taught students enough that when you ask them a question, they have some thoughts about how to solve the problem, and then they can go and try to solve the problem and you provide some just-in-time support as they need it. Now, there are people out there, Paul Kirshner and other people that would say, no guided instruction, it's all direct instruction, that's the best way to go. I worry about students' motivation. I worry about their ability to develop self-regulatory skill if you don't provide them some guided instruction opportunities. Um, but I, I do agree that that shouldn't be the first thing that we do. We should probably teach students the foundational things that they need directly and then give them opportunities to practice it and explore with some guidance. That's my view on it. Okay, cool. So there's a big English word that I really struggle to pronounce um, and Google Translate did not really help. Um, so I'm going to try again. Um, egalitarian. Egal um, it's it's a, the belief that it's based that everyone's equal. Equalit hmm. Okay, you, you have the, the basis of that word is equal. Um, egalitarian. I think I have it now. Egalitarian. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I think uh, learning styles come from that view. And 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 and. It, and that one article that I gave the teachers really um, promoted that, that yes, learning styles is, the idea is not bad. Teachers want to help everyone. They want to have equal, give equal access. They want the classrooms to be inclusive. It's a, so obviously teachers always look for ways um, to accommodate everyone. So, but the, the data that we've been presented with is in the end, we are not really helping everyone except if we personalize the learning, um, then, then maybe we can say that we, we, we are helping everyone. So the question now is, is there data that says, so you've, you've already made the distinction that learners are different, but say for instance, there's people that say, no, everyone's good at math. It's just maybe you've been taught wrong. Um, or everyone's good at languages. You just didn't have the right teacher. I think Richard Feynman once said, if you don't like physics, you didn't have the right physics teacher. So, so yes, so that's basically my question. Be, where's your, your views on that? So I like to say that the vast majority of people have more than enough capacity to learn to do what they want to do with hard work and good instruction and good feedback and time. Now, Certainly there are, you know, all of us have kind of limitations, right? So I'll never be able to dunk a basketball. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that I won't be able to do, but can I get better at basketball by practicing and getting coaching and feedback? Absolutely. And I, you know, there's a word that we use in ISIS, which is called equity, which is students should have equitable opportunities to maximize their capacities to be successful. And that's what we try to do. We try to provide students what they need to be successful. And again, it can be really difficult. The more students you're teaching, the harder it is to find time to differentiate and, and individualize. But I believe the vast majority of students, if they can get that kind of support and they are given the opportunity to learn, they can do what they want. But, but equal access does not guarantee equal outcome. Okay, um, right. is, that, is that true? Sure. So access alone is not enough. We want students to have access. Um, and sometimes we need to differentiate access. Some students need more help getting that access than others. Um, but, you know, there's absolutely a role for um, effort. There's a role for um, guidance. There's a role for coaching. There's a role for just time. Um, I know, you know, it took me 
a really long time to learn some concepts in my graduate program and not as much time to learn others. And that's just, those are some individual differences. Um, but if students work hard and get support, um, I like to think that the vast majority of them can do what they want to do. Okay, that is, that is great. So um, what I'm taking away is the, as a teacher, it's the best practice would be to um, give the learners exposure to as many teaching strategies as possible. Um, don't just, um, just don't, don't just do direct instruction or just group work or just, um, or, or, or should it be better to specialize in one strategy? So there really is a, a kind of an interaction between what you're trying to teach and who you're trying to teach it to and the context in which they find themselves. And that can determine kind of the best way to teach. And that's really kind of the science and the art of teaching. So I like teachers to have a lot of different strategies and then I trust them to be good professionals and to say, okay, with Jeff right here, I know something about Jeff and I think this particular strategy is gonna work really well with, with Jeff. And then you kind of figure out like, well, I'm teaching Jeff this topic and it seems like he's really responding well to this kind of instruction. So let me try that. Oh, that didn't work. Let me try something different. But the more strategies people know and the more they understand the science of learning, the better I think teachers will be at doing that really special thing that teachers do that's hard, that they do well, which is individualizing to the individual student and figuring out what combination of strategies would work best for that content for that student or those students. Okay, great. Um, I think we've touched on everything that um, the people mentioned. I just want to quickly browse through the chats. Um, if there's people who want to get in contact with you, um, can they and how? Sure. Yeah, I'll put my email in the chat here. They're welcome to reach out. You can also uh, contact me on Twitter if you want to too. Okay, cool. Um, in South Africa, we are not very keen on Twitter. Um, I don't know why, okay. but um, we're a Facebook country. The majority of our people are on Facebook. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I think we are four or five years behind, but that's okay. Um, so thank you for your email. And a lot of people mm -hmm. said that you gave them food for thought. And that's the only, that's what that's we great. wanted. That's what we wanted to achieve. Um, we want teachers yeah. to reflect on that practice, but you say in the stage, you, your teachers are very busy. In South Africa, I think um, we are abnormally busy. Like we are the, the coaches, we are the teachers, we are the directors of the art programs. Our teachers work on average um, nine to 11 hours a day um, wow. and they work on weekends. And I'm not talking about what the contract says they are working. I mean, what they are actually doing. They are marking right. scripts right. and they are preparing and. So there's not a lot of time to reflect on practice. So basically what you, you do is you, you do what you've always have been doing. I don't, don't sure. think that grammar sure. was right. But, but so it's good for us here to have um, a place where we can reflect. And then I'm, I'm inviting the teachers to, if, if, you, if you do not agree with us or with the whatever, get in contact with us. Let's have a talk. Um, talk with your peers at school, um, mm -hmm. read up on some liter literature, don't just go on anecdotal evidence. Um, as, but yeah, so that is, that, that is from my side. Jeff, anything else from your side? No, I, I really appreciate everyone's time and um, engaging with me and great questions. And I, I agree with you, teachers are experts and teachers are professionals. And so you should never just kind of uh, without question, believe anyone, including me, um, you should think again and reflect um, and I trust that you'll come to a, a great decision. Um, so again, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate it. it, it yeah, it was fun. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for um, being patient with my English. Um, next time yeah. I'll do better. You did great. Thank you again. <laughs> and thank you everyone. Um, we'll share this presentation with everyone and Jeff gave us permission. So thank you. Enjoy your day. What's the time there? It is two, two in the afternoon. Okay, enjoy so. the rest of your day. I'm going to sleep. Great. Now. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.